Hey, thanks everyone for coming. Um, good to see everyone. This is part of our seminar series that we've been running this year, uh, uh, where we're trying to provide some education around real estate. Um, tonight, obviously, some information um, about selling real estate. Uh, this is really a, a, a good opportunity tonight. We think to talk about a few things that often when we're talking to people about real estate, we don't get into some of the nitty gritty. This is a little bit of the behind the scenes stuff that just seems to happen. So uh, yeah, really excited about sharing some of this information tonight. So um, uh, we've called it, uh, I think we called it our top secret insider tips or something like that. So uh, a little bit cheeky to call it uh, top secret, but as I said, this just happens to be a bit more detailed than what we would normally um, talk about. So tonight we're just going to run through five tips about uh, uh, about selling and about the market and some of the mechanics behind uh, selling real estate. Um, uh, a lot of it is focused on uh, buyers because at the end of the day if you're selling real estate you're looking for buyers. So how do we how do we find these buyers? So run through those five tips. Um, at the end we'll have a bit of time for Q&A so I'd love you to try and stump me with some questions because I've got Sam here as a backup if you've got some really tough questions. So Sam, you'll be, uh, you'll be in the hot seat if I don't have the answers. So uh, uh, I'm looking forward to that. Um, so a quick run through that. If we've got some time, I've, I've put together a little bit of information uh, on the local market, what's just been happening in the local market, uh, in terms of where prices are sitting uh, from a property value, but also some information on uh, the rental values and what's happening in the rental market. So uh, we'll share that. Uh, uh, and then, yeah, we'd love everyone to hang around and have a quick, uh, another coffee or a, a quick chat. There'll be uh, a bit of food and coffee on at the end. So, uh, so yeah, thank you everyone for coming. Um, uh, just as a quick introduction for those who don't know me, uh, my name's Matt Jones, so obviously here from Jeff Jones Real Estate. Uh, I'm one of the partners here at Jeff Jones Real Estate. Uh, my background in terms of real estate, uh, I've been selling real estate around the area now for 13 years. Uh, Ticked over just over 700 transactions, so uh, seen a lot of uh, a lot of transactions over the years. Uh, what we notice uh, as we go through those transactions, there seems to be certain things that we do uh, in transactions that ends up getting a better result. Uh, so these are things that don't happen every time, but uh, there just seems to be certain uh, aspects of a of a real estate strategy in regards to sales that gets us better results. So. Um, yeah, so the point of time was just to share some of that information with you. So um, I just thought I'd start with a quick little show of hands though, just to see uh, everyone's experience in terms of selling it. Has everyone sold a property before? All been, all been sellers? Yeah. Um, once? Anyone sold more than once? More than one property? Yeah, good. Nora's so. Eh? More than five? Nora? <laughs> more than ten? Oh. Do you want me to keep going? Or... 30. 30, there you go, okay. So that's the end of my um, uh, presentation. Nora's going to get up now. And, um, no? uh, it's an interesting thing because, I mean, we're talking about, um, generally speaking, uh, someone's most valuable asset. Uh, but something that, you know, for most people, uh, in our experience, it's something they might do two or three times in their lifetime. Uh, I also find interesting to, during the process, um, I think largely to a lack of information education sometimes, it, it's quite a rushed process and a, and a process that people go into without a lot of uh, knowledge on, on how it works. So yeah, it's interesting uh, when you think about selling your car and the research you can do in terms of getting on Cars Guide and all that sort of stuff, uh, how much time you put into that. But the decision to sell a property can be you know, really quite an expedited process. So. Um, okay, so what are we running through tonight? Um, these are the five, uh, five topics we're going to talk about. So, uh, uh, first one, uh, getting buyers to fall in love with your property. Uh, how do we find buyers to fall in love? Um, uh, share a bit of how buyers find your property. Uh, third, uh, the concept of making it easy for your buyer. Uh, fourthly, uh, eliminating the renegotiation process. Uh, and fifthly, uh, finding the right agent. Uh, so there's some, uh, some topics for us tonight. So uh, first thing we're getting into is just a little bit of information about how buyers search for properties. Uh, uh, we're going to largely talk about online. Obviously the online market space with, uh, has changed real estate over the last 10 years. So uh, the research tells us that 86% of buyers search online. Uh, so there is still 14% of people who aren't online. 
uh, or aren't looking online, uh, but obviously the vast majority of people are looking online. Uh, and when we talk online, of course, uh, we are largely talking about that website that everyone knows, which is realestate.com.au. Uh, it has over the last, really over the last five or six years, become almost a magnet or a landing place that people are aware of in terms of real estate in Australia, particularly Queensland. Um, there are other websites, of course, the domains and, and others, but uh, as it is, realestate.com.au um, is very much the central funnel in terms of people getting their real estate information. Um, funnily enough, uh, realestate.com, yeah, it's by far the most used by a research tool. Uh, it is the 18th most visited site in Australia in terms of websites. So it just shows how much interest people have in real estate. Uh, anyone like to have a guess how many unique people visit realestate.com each month? How many, well, how many individual people get on that website every month? Any ideas? 24 million people in Australia. So uh, 5.8 million people visit realestate.com.au every month. So nearly a quarter of the population get on that website. Um, yeah, which just, as I said, shows the, uh, the interest that people have in real estate. Obviously, we haven't got a quarter of the population looking at moving at any one time. So, um, yeah, it's a massive amount. Um, Realestate.com, for those who don't know, um, is uh, majority owned by News Corp. Um, Mr Murdoch owns realestate.com. Um, its value currently is $7.7 .7 billion. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's an, it's an amazing business. Uh, I didn't bring up the graph of its share price, but uh, as you can imagine, with the business value at seven point seven million dollars, that their own business, I should buy the shares. <laughs> well, you could have had them, I think, for about ten cents at one point, and yeah. I think now they're 40, now? forty odd dollars. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's an incredible business. They've done something. Um, at the end of that's an advertising business. And they've managed to put together this this de uh, destination in terms of where people go and find their real estate information. So uh, other people would love to have that space. But to put it in perspective, um, a business value that's $7.7 .7 billion um, domain, which is the second most used website, uh, is owned by Fairfax. Um, so Fairfax Media. Fairfax as an entire company with all their newspapers and all other websites they do, is valued at $2 billion. So their whole business is valued at $2 billion, uh, realestate.com as one little part of Mr Murdoch's, uh, good evening, how are you? Mr Murdoch's um, uh, empire is uh, $7.7 .7 billion worth of, uh, uh, worth of, uh, of websites. So, um, yeah, so it's a really, uh, it's a really uh, interesting dynamic. Uh, just to share a little bit about how that website works um, in terms of selling and finding buyers, um, it's quite interesting that uh, 70%, and this is some, some insight that we get from real estate from there, 70% of visitors uh, search by the suburb only with no further filtering. So by far the most common way to try and find a property on realestate.com <coughs> is to type in Cooparoo and start trying to figure it out for yourself. Um, there are some reasons why they do that. Um, so obviously the option of I only want to find a unit in these four suburbs or I want to find the newest stuff, or whatever it might be. Seven out of ten people just off they go. Type in Cooper and away they go. Um, somewhere between 53 and 69 percent of visitors don't look ever look past page one. Uh, I say 53 to 69 percent because um, realestate.com.au have supplied us two lots of stats around that. So, so it's either 53 or 69 percent, but it's certainly a large majority of people. And I think a lot of that comes from we're just looking at the newer stuff. So the perception of whatever's up at the start of the website will be new. Keep in mind that there's nearly six million people looking every month, so these people are visiting very frequently. Um, an interesting thing uh, in terms of uh, buyers looking for property, uh, less than 10% of the visitors research sold prices. So for those, I'm sure everyone's been on realestate.com.au, but you've got a section about buying, you've got a section about renting, you've got a section about sold. Uh, and the sold section is a really great resource for property owners or property buyers 
to see what's going on uh, in the marketplace. Uh, but the absolute vast majority of buyers uh, do not look mm -hmm. at that page. I don't um, look because it's going up, up, up. Every maybe month. they don't want to. They don't want to look. <laughs> it just um, keeps going up. The price is. So I think the, the interesting uh, the, the interesting lesson there uh, in terms of someone selling is that the buyers are not necessarily comparing your property to what has been sold, they're comparing it to what else is on the market. So you're very much in competition with the properties that are currently on the market. Uh, so yes, it's surprising. We would love the, the sold page to be more widely used. Uh, and, if, and if you go on the, uh, particularly on realestate.com.au, um, you know, it's, it's a really good re resource these days in terms of seeing sale prices of properties that are, have just been sold. Uh, as soon as our properties are sold, uh, generally speaking, the sale prices will go on there. That information is freely available through the Department of Natural Resources these days, about six to eight weeks after the property is sold anyway through RP Data and CoreLogic, the, the, the data companies that, that look at all of this information. So certainly from our point of view and from um, uh, a lot of real estate agents' point of view these days, we would like the marketplace to be more educated. So we figure if it's going to go online within six to eight weeks, we might as well put it up there now. Um, so, but yeah, less than 10% of people are looking at that. So, um, um, so I just wanted to run you through a few little tips, and I think I've got them in your, your handout, um, about how you can get a better result in terms of being on these websites. And this isn't specifically um, about realestate.com.au, but I'm, I am talking about that website particularly because it's such a, a strong website. Um, just in terms of a quick insight with, with, um, with our business, um, it is almost 90% of our online inquiry comes from that one website. So. Uh, we are, uh, have properties advertised on every major portal, the domains, uh, there's a whole range of others, home hounds and real estate views, etc, etc. There's, I think there's about 13 or 14 websites. Um, yeah, it's, it's just under 90% of the inquiry comes straight off that realestate.com.au website. So, um, and, uh, so uh, here's some little tips um, about how you can get a better result online. Um, and of course, Number one um, is photos. So get your photos <coughs> absolutely spot on. Uh, sometimes that means you have to do it twice. <coughs> so you get the photos and they don't look quite right. Um, you need a hero shot. Ben, you might be able to help us with this, but uh, that first shot is just so important in terms of that search capability online. You might have noticed um, on a lot of the websites now, including realestate.com.au, uh, that there is no headline uh, on the search results, so there's no text, there's no ad copy, uh, it is just the photo and the price and the, the uh, attributes of the property. So uh, they're showing you how important that photo is. Uh, obviously a nice big photo, so we can't even put the story in. As you click through you can get the story etc etc, but in terms of the search results and trying to get that click through, the photo has to be, you know, has to be really appealing. Um, Floor plans. So floor plans are viewed by up to 90% of visitors. Um, and generally it sits somewhere between 70 to 90% of all people who look at a property online will actually look at the floor plan. So, um, yeah, can we could look at it. Um, just a lesson, uh, and without going into too much of the detail, realestate.com, the other websites, but they obviously prior prioritise placement. Being advertising companies, they prioritise where your ad might sit. Um, it's really important that you prioritise your position from day one. Um, uh, the the drop-down rate almost immediately, but certainly within two weeks on those websites in terms of how many people will visit your property is, is enormous. Um, uh, in terms of being in a priority position, um, in our experience, to not have that priority position uh, will, can affect how many people you'll see your property by up to 400%. So we can drop literally the number of clicks on a property by three quarters if it's not positioned properly on the website. So, um, If marketing with a price, get reliable objective advice. Uh, as I said, the only two things really that are shown on, on the website now in terms of searching for properties is a photo and the price. So they're the two things that your buyers have to compare your properties. Uh, and if the price, obviously the price doesn't sit where it should in terms of that comparison, again, it will have an impact on how many people go and click through. 
Um, now, in terms of getting objective advice at the moment, they said the sole page of realestate.com and some analysis of that can really help. Uh, if we can get that number up beyond the 10% of people who go and look at that. Um, uh, don't rush the process. Uh, and we say think of product launch. So uh, I guess this is a concept of getting all your ducks in a row in terms of launching your property to the market. Um, we see some, some interesting things uh, online. Sometimes we'll see photos coming soon. Uh, or more photos coming soon. So uh, in the rush to get a property on the market, uh, someone has missed a few steps. Uh, uh, the quantity of photos can be really important if they're really good quality photos. So the more photos we have of the property, the more likely it is to, uh, basically people will stay on that website longer, and stay on that page longer. So, um, and that can also tie in, in terms of an online investment, having everything ready. So um, yeah, this is a big, uh, a big process getting, in terms of a whole campaign, making sure online spot on and that ties in with what's happening in terms of inspections and open houses and a sign going up. Uh, you just put all this time and effort into putting the ad online and getting the photos right, etc. Um, but there's no sign out the front of the house for people to drive past Smith Street and find the property. So uh, get it all right. Uh, I guess the concept of product launch is uh, when Coke brings out Coke Zero, they don't just say, oh, well, well, we'll put some of this Coke in a can and we'll put it on the shelves and we better do some ads down the track, that'll work. They sort of sit there, everyone's going to buy it anyway, but they sit there and they put it all together and they throw it out there as one big, uh, one, one single launch. So, um, really important in terms of online to review your marketing strategy weekly. Um, so sometimes it's not working. Uh, it's not attracting the people and it could be changes like our photos aren't right. Um, it could be where it's sitting on the website. Um, the beauty of online is we get immediate feedback in terms of we, uh, you can pull out information about how many people have clicked on your property on a per day basis. Uh, with most of the websites, and again we're talking about realestate.com.au, they will give you uh, data on how your property is performing relative to other properties in the neighbourhood. Um, so they'll give you a comparison to uh, to the average or the median property in your in your marketplace. So, uh, funny enough, we can see some of that information sometimes, and we're struggling, and we we make some strategic changes, and we can bring it back up. Um, now, this is all um, brought together as part of the concept that uh, the more eyeballs that are on your website looking at these properties, the more traffic it will generate in terms of inspections, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, at the end of the day, having your property online is a marketing exercise, uh, and the object of it is to get as many people as possible clicking on that property. So, um, um, oh, and seventh, uh, seventh is don't over overlook other uh, online opportunities. Um, so we've talked a little bit about realestate.com or a lot about realestate.com.au. At the moment, it is absolutely the place where your property needs to be featured uh, in terms of getting uh, the right response. Uh, I suspect in five years time, we'll be having a totally different conversation. Uh, it was different uh, to some degree five years ago, a little bit more. It was a little bit different in terms of domain and things like that as well. So, uh, so what's happening in terms of online? I guess my uh, thought is just to keep in mind that things change. Um, I used to use web crawler to find everything on the internet. Sam, that might be slightly before your time, but uh, we get on we get in our Netscape. Uh, browser and get on web crawler and we could find everything we wanted to. So things change a little bit. Um, so, so what's next? Uh, this isn't a new concept, but um, I don't know if everyone's uh, familiar with a website called Facebook. I think we might all know Facebook. So, um, Facebook uh, has some interesting capabilities. This just happens to be a, a page that we have on there. Funny enough, we've got that on there. Um, but in terms of uh, finding people who uh, are interested in, in property. Facebook, from an advertising education point of view, has some amazing capabilities. Uh, uh, and again, Facebook is basically set up as an advertising company. Uh, it generates revenue through advertising. Uh, it's not something that is widely used from a real estate point of view at the moment, but uh, I think that's something that's going to change really quickly, and that's the next 12 months uh, that that will change. Um, Facebook has an amazing capability to um, pinpoint particular demographics. 
So um, we can find people on there aged, aged between a certain age bracket in a certain location who have certain interests uh, and you can target advertising directly for them. So realestate.com.au at the moment is we put it out there, we let people go and find it uh, as opposed to being very targeted on, on who we're looking for. Um, interesting enough, uh, for us in 2016, 67% of our buyers have been located in Brisbane. So we know that two thirds of the buyers are in Brisbane. So then we obviously get some interstate people, but just out of Brisbane. But yeah, the majority of our buyers are in Brisbane. Um, so yeah, where Facebook will really come into its own is, um, do you have the ability to target a particular demographic of buyer? Um, if it's an investor, you can target people who have interest in property investment. You can target people who have interest in renovations. Um, uh, so yeah, and that can be that can be as simple as, as something like we've done here. I'm going to show you a little thing that we've we put up on Facebook just a few <coughs> weeks ago uh, in terms of um, introducing people uh, to a, a new unit that we have for sale. Peter Brown, Jeff Jones, Real Estate. I'd like to welcome to my new listing. This is five of eighteen at Vine Street, Green Slopes. Very well positioned unit, just down from the Stones Corner Village. Uh, we're just going to scan around and show you some features of the unit. Lovely large open living spaces, very neutral colours, the survey very, very livable area. Just going to swing around now behind and show you an open plain kitchen. And a very dedicated, nice living space here in the dining area. So the features in this unit, we have uh, two bedrooms, two baths, uh, we have the ensuite. Uh, and with our laundry facilities upstairs. So very contained unit, a small block of five. We'll just switch through and give you a look at these large bedrooms now. Nice livable space with wood built-ins here. En suite there, straight off the, uh, off the main bedroom. And we might just come into the second bedroom. I'll show you that because it's quite a large second bedroom. So certainly for over, you've got visitors over, they've got their own space here, have their own bathroom, very usable. Plus if you want to call, convert this into a work office, Sunny, very, very usable. Okay, we'll just come back out again. Oh, well, one of the most attractive units we listed just lately, I think it's going to have a lot of people to general market, uh, investors, very close to uh, hospitals, to Stones Corner, so great potential there for your ongoing with the rent potential. So, yeah, come along, have a look at 5 of 18 Bowen Street. Uh, very happy to show you through. Thank you. How about that, Pete, hey? So that was Pete, who we put on the spot there. That was, uh, that was some live uh, streaming to Facebook, so one take only. He's a natural. Um, so, uh, and the quality of that is actually a bit better than that. It was a screen capture that we've done just to show you tonight. Although it's just done on your phone, etc., etc. So the interesting thing about where this is heading, um, so at the end of the day there was an advertising component to that uh, for us in terms of Vine Street. Um, I think our budget there was around about $16. So it was a really expensive exercise. Um, $16 on Facebook, um, uh, meant that that ended up in front of 2,707 people of a very defined demographic. And I think our demographic there was very much pitched at uh, a younger demographic in terms of first home buyers, etc., etc. So some of the interest they had was first homes, investing, um, uh, styling, design, that type of demographic. Um, and uh, we generated uh, 839 people watched that video. Uh, and there is uh, some measurement there of them actually watching it for a period of time, so it's not I clicked on it for one second and it wasn't of interest to me. But they actually watched that for some period of time. Maybe not quite right the way through, I'm sure they would have, Peter, but a long way through it anyway. Um, so, uh, yeah, that capability, uh, and this is particularly in terms of uh, going live to Facebook at the moment. Facebook Live, if anyone follows social media stuff, is, is absolutely a buzzword at the moment in terms of uh, what's happening. There are auctioneers in Sydney uh, who are broadcasting auctions live. We, we did one live as well um, the other week, but there are auctioneers in Sydney um, with people, uh, over 20,000 people watching auctions over a weekend. So just uh, enormous uh, potential there. I said, I think you'll, we're going to see over the next 12 months the power of this, particularly in terms of that targeted 
marketing opportunity. So, uh, and yes, yeah, so a particular type of property or a particular area or it attracts a particular demographic of buyer. It really gives you an opportunity to, to focus in uh, on that. So to put that in perspective, um, uh, with 839 views of that, um, well, 2,700 people seeing in their feed, 839 views, um, we would expect to see somewhere between two and 3,000 people look at a property like that on realestate.com through a whole campaign. Um, this only ran for a period of, I think, five days. So we say it's from a live concept, it needs to be fairly recent. We couldn't run a three week old live video on there. Um, so yeah, really interesting to see uh, the, the pullback we can get on that. Uh, with our uh, auction uh, that we ran as a live stream the other day, um, I think we've had something along the lines of well, quite a few thousand anyway, people watch a live auction that we did up in Greensides the other day. Um, the, the real power of the, of the live concept is it is live streamed in real time, but there's the, obviously the, cap the capability to go back and watch it at a later time. So, uh, but yeah, just the, the pulling power of, of video. And the interesting thing around these numbers, although that was a almost a quite homemade basic sort of video, um, if you, if for quite a few years now, you've seen sort of professional video shoots in terms of properties and drone cameras and all this sort of stuff, which is great. But you'll often see those videos, um, I think there's an issue with how they're marketed, but they might um, have 30 or 40 people watch them over a whole campaign. So, uh, and I think an aspect of that is the challenge in trying to get there, um, that yeah, it's sort of linked away from something. Uh, this concept of things happening in real time and particularly from a social media point of view of, hey, this is happening right now, uh, is kind of exciting that, that essentially we can walk around as a, as a quick introduction to a property. Um, and I said, yeah, well, at the end of the day, with a, yeah, a, a, a very cost-effective process in terms of a $16 marketing campaign, we can find that and do people who we know have a re we've got a really reasonable chance that they have some interest um, in the property. So, uh, so that's just a little bit about what's happening on the online space. Um, I'd love to say that's just all about Facebook right now, but uh, realestate.com is still really important, but uh, yeah, an interesting development. Um, okay, I want to talk a little bit about uh, maximising uh, buyer appeal. Um, so how do we actually get people to love, to love your property? Um, uh, and we talk a little bit about the 60 second test. And I guess this is uh, talking um, to a large degree about present uh, presenting the property correctly, um, uh, have, you know, what improvements you make to the property, etc., etc. Of course, there's a whole myriad of information online about this, and every website has information about what you should do about you know, cleaning the gardens and all that sort of stuff. So, um, look, the biggest, the best advice we can we can give people is to um, is the 60 second test, which is just basically the concept that someone will they're walking through the house, they're either into it or they're not. Um, so yeah, so much of that, um, uh, so much effort and so much interest in, do I get a good feel for this thing as soon as I walk, in, or walk onto the property? Um, uh, so uh, again, just some, some information from, from, from our business. Um, this year, 80% of our buyers have bought a property after looking at it only once. So eight out of 10 buyers will only do one inspection, um, which means they're probably spending less than 15 minutes at the property before they make a decision to purchase it. So, um, yeah, it, it just shows you the power of it. And obviously a lot of that happening at an open house type situation on a Saturday with other people around, they're doing a quick walk through. So they're over, it's just so powerful around, well, I either like this property or I don't. Is this the one for me? Um, <coughs> so, yeah, a general rule uh, in terms of the presentation stuff then is absolutely what is going to give you bang for your buck in terms of I walk straight in and I like this place. There's a few old things that probably take it too far these days. Um, the cookies baked in the oven is probably out these days. Um, setting the table up with the, uh, the nice setting that we're about to have a dinner party is probably not what we're going for these days. The roses in the bathtub uh, is probably taking a little too far. Um, that wasn't one of our properties that we have recently sold, but. Um, Nice concept, but probably taking it a bit too far in terms of the presentation uh, as well. So, uh, look, really, it can often be some really quick, easy things. So, um, 
here's our six. I think again they're in your little book here in terms of um, uh, six real quick fixes. Um, first one, paint the front stairs and paint the front door. So coming straight up those stairs in our old Queenslanders, they've normally had a bit of wear and tear on them. They're up and down all the time. Let people have that nice feel as they're coming straight through the door. The front garden, sometimes we can get away with a little less in the back garden, but we've got to get them through the front door first. So uh, it's amazing. Uh, a quick play in the front garden uh, for an afternoon can tidy all that up. Um, really important to get as much natural light in the property as possible. Um, so that can mean taking curtains down, taking blinds down, uh, uh, or certainly opening them up. Uh, how can we maximise the light? Be one of your biggest complaints from a buyer of a property is dark. They want to see it light. So, uh, so then often it, it's literally just, let's get rid of these curtains. You've got these big heavy drapes. Um, let's take them off. Particularly if they're looking a bit baggy, they can just go. Um, neatly arranging storage spaces. So everyone does this big declutter when they're looking to sell and everything ends up in the garage, uh, which is a, the best place for it rather than in the property. But uh, then we run into a problem where we don't look like we've got a good lot of storage space. So it can still be there. If you can get it offside, even better. But let's get that storage space looking really usable. Uh, and again, depending on the type of property, but if we're tight on space, you have some really good space in some of our houses downstairs, you know, really adds some value in terms of you know, guys having hobbies and you know, trying to get stuff uh, out of the way. Um, get your bathroom sparkling uh, is a big one. And that can be as simple as, okay, we need to re-silicon, we need to give things a bit of a paint. Uh, if, if it is that um, you are looking to sell in the near future, often a full bathroom renovation won't be a great return on your investment. Uh, there are simple improvements that you can do to make your property, to make that bathroom look better. It could be just a, a quick coat of paint. Um, mold, uh, exit mould will be your best friend. No mould in the bathroom. Um, and a little one about minimising personal photos. So if you've got your big family photos, that I guess is a concept of a buyer walking through and taking some ownership of it in that 10 minutes, uh, rather than feeling like they're being intrusive and looking through someone else's property. So uh, I said there's heaps of information about that online. Uh, but the big message is, uh, and you'll find a checklist of a hundred things, but you've really got to think about well, what is going to have impact for a buyer as they walk straight through the door. So, um, okay, this is the exciting one for us, uh, the concept um, of making it easy for a buyer. Um, so why do we, this is the whole process from go to woe, um, being easy for a buyer. Um, so why do we want to do that? Quite simply because we might end up with more of them. So uh, at the end of the day, uh, when you're on the market trying to sell your property, you're in competition with all the other properties. Um, often the location is the same, the features are very similar. The difference between someone wanting to buy your property and someone else's could just literally be that the, we've, we've set it up and we've made that process easier. So we've got some things that we think add some real value uh, in terms of making the whole process easier for a buyer and getting you a better result. So, uh, I'm just going to run through a few of them. Um, first one is the concept of getting a building and pest inspection prior to your sale. Um, so there's a few reasons why we do it. Um, one reason, uh, it gives us an opportunity to attend to issues prior to selling. So often someone will get a building and pest inspection, they'll find out there is actually an issue with their property that may be worth attending to, so it's not an issue for a potential buyer. Um, Second reason, uh, there is an independent expert opinion on the condition of the property to assist sellers and buyers when determining the value of the property. So you're both looking at an independent uh, opinion on the condition of the property. Um, uh, and thirdly, uh, we, it's a great resource to determine the most interested buyers. I guess what I mean there is having that report available to potential buyers, um, uh, any genuine interest buyer in your property will want to see that report. So I guess it's a qualifying tool for you uh, to have buyers taking that report, you know that they've got some genuine reserve in the property. So, um, so uh, interesting what the outcome uh, of that is, um, in terms of having that pre-sale building and pest inspection, holding that. Uh, for us, uh, again, for this, is this year's stats, 65% uh, of the contracts that we've put together where we've had a pre-sale building and pest inspection has not been subject to any further inspections. So a buyer will accept that report in 65% of cases. Uh, uh, 
for us, that building and pest inspection is done by obviously an independent third party. It's done by a qualified building and pest inspector. Um, in our case, they are available to talk to any prospective buyers and run through any of the information in there. So it is good, reliable third party information. Um, it is the same building and pest inspection inspector they would likely use if they were to go and get their own. Uh, of course, a buyer can then go and get those, and we're saying in well, nearly two -third, or one third of cases they are going and getting their own inspection anyway. Um, the interesting stats out of that, um, this year we've had 10 properties uh, where we've had to renegotiate the sale price due to issues that have come up on building and pest inspections where we haven't held them, um, ranging between $880,000 and $30,000 uh, in terms of a renegotiation process. On average, taking out the $30,000, which was an extreme, but on average, uh, $3,470 in terms of a change in the purchase price. Uh, based on investigations that the buyer has carried out post-sale. Um, I, I think the, uh, the attitude of a buyer um, and their headspace in terms of viewing that inspection is very different once they've committed to spending a lot of money on a property. They're looking for issues potentially, there's a concern about the purchase price, have they paid too much, they start getting bad news, indifferent information, of course that's playing on their mind, that's generally going to have them thinking, gee, we paid too much, we better see what we can do about this. So for us in terms of a private treaty situation in Queensland where the property is for sale, obviously, generally speaking, they're subject to a buyer doing their own investigations. Um, to have that information up front, uh, so it gives the buyer a really good chance to have a look at it. If they do go and get their own building and pest inspections, uh, we've got a starting point in terms of what we agree or what I guess the seller has based their expectations on their sale at. So it would only be from there you would, that a buyer would find something different to that, that there would there could be an opportunity there that they would, they would take up an opportunity to renegotiate. So, uh, so yeah, so for us, well, 13 properties we've had to sell this year uh, with, with um, building best inspections in place pre-sale, uh, we've had zero renegotiations. So. When we're looking at an average of $3,470 when it becomes an issue, and it happens fairly regularly, um, 10 times this year, so more than once a month, just out of our office, we're having to go and renegotiate the sale. So, um, yeah, really good uh, information. Uh, second one, talking specifically about body corporates, um, uh, but can also apply in terms of um, council approval information if you've, you've made renovations and things, but having having documentation, uh, and we're talking about having detailed body corporate information. Um, contractually, there is very little information that you need to supply as a seller of a unit uh, in terms of disclosing the uh, history of the body corporate. Uh, you've basically got to supply some information about the insurance, what the levies are, um, and if there are any known defects, um, but it's a fairly limited list. Um, uh, there, there is the ability to provide more information. I guess this is just all the concept of being more open with your buyer, making it easier for your buyer. Um, and again, there's a few reasons why we do it. Uh, number one, again, we could be unaware of outstanding issues. So sometimes things will come up there that the seller is even unaware about because they haven't closely followed their, their, their body corporate um, over a number of years. That could have affected the value of the property. Um, Conversely, a, a property that's well managed by the body corporate can have a positive impact on the value of the property. So we've got a nice big sinking fund, our contributions are quite low, uh, there are no ongoing issues, that'll be looked upon favourably by a buyer. Um, we can show a good history in terms of the last four or five years rather than just what's happened right now. Um, uh, and uh, thirdly, uh, our, our more cautious buyers uh, can research strata history quickly before committing to a purchase price. So. Um, it's only been, again, really over the last maybe 10 years, but certainly five years, that um, people have thought about providing more information beyond the, uh, the contractual obligation. Um, so uh, most common clause we would put on a unit contract uh, 10 years ago, or certainly five years ago even, was that the contract would be subject to the buyer carrying out uh, further investigations on the body corporate for a period of time and if they're not happy with anything for absolutely any reason they won't be buying the property. So we'd have to sort of wait and hope that, that nothing came out of that and let's see what happens. So uh, now it would be very rare for us to have that 
um, added to a contract. Uh, and even coming from a solicitor who would generally be very cautious about that, uh, if we have a more detailed body corporate statement, uh, we'll generally find that a solicitor would look through that and say, yeah, okay, well, we can see the history of this building. We're okay, we don't need to go through further detail in terms of it. So, um, oh, there you go. Okay, 93% of contracts this year not subject to further buyer inspections. So, not requiring that, uh, not requiring that, uh, that condition on the contract. Um, I guess the concept here around easier is, again, in competition with other properties, um, we've got two units to choose from with all of this information and a pre-sale building and pest inspection from a potential buyer's point of view, does that set them up that, okay, this property is going to be an easier process for us than jumping into this other one where we don't know anything about the history of the building, we don't know the condition of it as is, they're pretty similar, I think we'd better go this way, we're a little more educated, we feel a little more comfortable pursuing this property. So. Um, uh, the third one uh, is the concept of having uh, some, uh, a panel of independent experts. Um, and we're talking about here about the building and pest people. Uh, this is um, uh, somewhat uh, more relevant in terms of auctioning your property. Um, uh, building and pest inspectors, uh, solicitors, uh, finance people, mortgage people, um, available to your buyers, I guess through your real estate agent, realistically, uh, that are intimate with the particulars of your property. Um, so for us, uh, in terms of uh, taking property to auction, uh, we have a panel of mortgage brokers who are aware of it, they have a copy of the contract, they can freely talk to any buyers about it, get into position of pre-approvals, et cetera, so that the buyers are more comfortable proceeding with the property. Um, that from a solicitor point of view, uh, having, uh, again, independent solicitors where they can get some free legal advice about a contract or any issues that might be on any of these documents. Um, uh, again, can that make it easy for our buyers? Um, and the benefits there, yeah, so your buyers can, uh, can carry out those inquiries in a timely manner before having to commit to a purchase price. Uh, really importantly, the buyer's outlays are substantially reduced compared to the interest they might have in other properties. So with all of this stuff in place, um, your buyer can be well informed and basically it will cost them nothing to, to do their inquiries as opposed to property B where well, worst case scenario, in an auction, they've got to go and spend $500 on a building and pest inspection. Uh, they've got to go and see a lawyer. It might cost a few hundred dollars. Um, uh, they're $800, $900 before they can even start. Uh, that is going to be off-putting for a lot of buyers, uh, unless they've got some real desire around that property. Uh, it's just going to be a difficult one. Uh, most common complaint we see, particularly in the state in Sydney and Melbourne, where they have some real issues around Underquoting and prices and auctions and Nora's nodding. Okay. Um, but yeah, that issue of people having to do all that sort of investigation work and spend hundreds, their issue is more than it's around the prices are totally out of out of position of where they, they might have been, but an expensive exercise. So um, so yeah, that, as I said that's just a concept in terms of can we set this thing up? And the whole point of this is let's elevate this property over the other properties on the marketplace. Um, okay, just a quick one. I've put some information in your um, uh, in your folders. I won't go through all of the stuff about um, how to find a real estate agent. I've got some great ideas there, funnily enough, but I'll, I'll leave people to make their own minds up there. So, um, but just a couple of little things in terms of working with a real estate agent. So I won't go into all the fabulous stuff about what great value we had to the transaction and how we're really nice people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but just a couple of little things that you can do in, find, in terms of finding a real estate agent. And funnily enough, of a lot of things that I don't see people doing uh, in terms of trying to work with the right real estate agent. So, um, concept number one uh, is you can always take your, your real estate agent for a test drive. You can go to open houses. So you can actually see how real estate agents work. Um, we were looking at getting a new accountant a little while ago and then we didn't change because I couldn't see that it was going to be any different. Uh, but then I couldn't sit in his office and see how we balanced the books and obviously work out that we had to pay less tax than, than what we did and all that. So we couldn't, we couldn't do it. But uh, yeah, real estate agents, you can go and see them in their working environment. And their working environment for you is going to, is what they do at an open house. Uh, it's showtime. It should, be, it should be them in their absolute best light too. So if something doesn't feel right in an open house, it's not a good look. Um, a quick one. Um, in terms of finding an agent, I would say to focus on the strategy to maximise the buyer interest. 
great competition and manage the process. Um, so yeah, really, what is, yeah, what's the plan more so than well, what, what is it going to sell for? Um, I think a really big one, uh, and again, not something that we have a lot of our clients ask for, but more than happy uh, to discuss it, but is to talk to past clients, referrals. So who can I talk to who's been in a similar situation? I'd love to know how they got on. Um, really important. Ask tough questions. I've got some tough questions in your book there. I won't go through them. It might, might be tough. But uh, yeah, there are some really pertinent questions I think you can ask of a real estate agent um, to determine whether they're a very good fit. Um, I think really important that you need to be comfortable with the strategy that you're working on. Uh, rather than take the real estate agent's advice, there's a whole bunch of ways to go about selling a property. Um, if you're not comfortable with it, it isn't going to be a good fit because this is a process that can take weeks um, and it's a pretty stressful process. You're selling your property, uh, you've got to be entirely comfortable with the strategy that's been agreed on. Um, generally speaking, if you're going into it um, with the real estate agent strategy, it's not going to be a good mix um, a few weeks down the track. So I said the questions are in, in the book in terms of what's, uh, what's there. So um, uh, look, that's, um, that's my five tips. So a bit short and sweet. Um, happy to answer any questions. A bit of information about what's happening in the market if, if everyone would like a, a bit of an insight into what's happening with our market and prices. But uh, anyone have any questions about, about that stuff? Yes? Who owns on the house? Who owns on the house? Um, I think they're called Console Holdings Group, um, which is actually a software supplier for the real estate industry. Um, yeah, so they, uh, I, on the house, I think is about to disappear. Mm -hmm. um, uh, unfortunately, have lost a lot of money. There's such a big difference though with what the price is. Prices, be. yeah. So the concept, as everyone's seen on the house and, and this concept of automatic sort of valuations and things. Is, is everyone familiar with, with the website? No? Okay. Um, so yeah, um, the idea of on the house is that you can type in one Smith Street and it's gonna pluck out the number and say it's worth this, but you say I normally say it's somewhere between 600 and 1.1 million or something. Uh, the concept of it, is, it comes from America. So there are websites in America, um, Trulia, uh, Zillow, um, that have that same sort of functionality. In America, and I believe it's associated with taxes, uh, the square footage of every property is known. So they, um, it's, it's, on, it's common uh, information. So they know the size of the land, they know the square footage, and they know the configuration of the property. So they have a lot more data that they can use uh, to determine that value. So if you go on there, the numbers are really quite tight. Um, uh, but they've tried to bring that concept over to Australia. But the only information that's publicly available uh, in terms of Department of Natural Resources information is the size of the land and the last sale price. So uh, there's no, uh, there's absolutely no record on improvements to the property, the size of the property. So yeah, two properties in the same street on 600 square metres, no differentiation. Obviously we can have a two bedroom shack and a knock down house that's now been turned into a six bedroom mansion. So. Yeah, great idea. Um, unfortunately, it's not going to it's not going to uh, it's not going to get the result that people would like. So, mm -hmm. any, any other questions? How much on average in a building and pricing special good cost? Oh yeah, between four and five hundred dollars. Um, and the real estate dot com dot varies uh, and varies by suburb and position, um, up to two thousand dollars to get a one prominent position. Um, so anywhere anywhere from nothing to 2,000. How long is that for? Um, indefinitely, but prominent position up to 45 days. So um, realestate.com, funnily enough, want everyone to have prominent position. They, they want you to spend that money. It's, I know it's a strange concept, but um, they certainly, we didn't talk to a lot about it tonight, but they prioritise people on their spending capacity, as you can imagine. And look, at the end of the day, I said without sharing all the detail tonight, they deliver in terms of prominence and properties being featured more heavily, there's no doubt about that. So, um, yeah, they got to being a $7.7 .7 billion company. One way they figured it out, so. Uh, yeah, any, any other questions? No, no?
All good? Yeah, good. Hey guys, hope that was good information. Um, does everyone want to have a quick look at the local market? Just It'll only take me a few minutes, just have a look at what's happening <laughs> in terms of prices. And I've done green slopes, so if you're out of green slopes, happy to share some stuff. Uh, we can get it to you online or something, but I did green slopes because I knew a couple of us from green slopes tonight. So, um, yeah, just a quick market update in terms of what's been happening in green slopes. Um, so, uh, interesting, yeah, interesting market. Uh, and this is, I'd say, pretty typical of all of our areas around here. Um, the data shows us that the median price in green slopes over the last 12 months for houses has increased 11.3%. Um, and I would say that that's probably a fairly <coughs> accurate reflection of the market. Uh, it's always interesting to look at the median value, uh, and particularly if we drill down to a single suburb, because we might be looking at 100 transactions. So it's only if there are just a few extra transactions at the top or the bottom of the market, it will throw these numbers out. But um, to me, that's probably a pretty accurate reflection of what's happened in green flows. We'll look at the graph in a second. Uh, units down 3.7%. Again, probably a pretty accurate reflection. So let's have a look at the graphs. Um, uh, yeah, median price 740 for houses, uh, 390 for units. So this is um, growth uh, in terms of houses uh, in green sites, uh, <coughs> from 98. So yeah, with our 11.3% growth, um, and this is only tracking to um, about April, I think, uh, of this year. Uh, you can see that that's, um, you know, we can see this real curve in terms of what's happened uh, with our prices in uh, in green sites. Pretty steady in terms of. Uh, growth. We go back to um, GFC here in 2010, uh, and we drop back. But yeah, you know, on those numbers, we still only drop back maybe to sort of where we were 2008, 2009 through 2010, 2011. So I can remember the predictions of 30 and 40 percent uh, drops in property prices when the global financial crisis came in, and well, wait, we're not going to buy now. The prices are going to come back 30 percent. We better, we better wait. So. Uh, and Alvin and Suburbs. So yeah, look, it's certainly a positive period of time. Obviously, the driver of that, low interest rates. Um, in terms of the green size market and houses, uh, a lot of transition from people out of units into houses. So maybe that next step in terms of the marketplace for them. Um, uh, and even at that 700,000 mark, uh, attracting, uh, although it's a smaller market, the first home buyers in terms of couples, young couples, etc. So. Um, uh, interesting thing we've seen for quite some time now is the number of transactions is actually quite a bit lower than where we were back in the early 2000s. Uh, and that's pretty much across the board for us in our inner, inner city areas. Um, the, the, the frequency of transactions has certainly dropped down. So uh, you can see some real growth here. Yeah, if we go back to 2011 GFC time, well, what are we? Um, less than 80 transactions uh, for the 12 months. Um, uh, and 160s and 170s back in 2001, 2002, so literally half the turnover. Uh, units. The graph changes a bit with units. Um, so this is our this is our growth graph. Uh, graph. Um, yeah, uh, a little bit wobbly uh, in terms of units post uh, GFC, and certainly not the growth that we've seen out of, of houses. But then we've had some massive growth through some of these periods. Um, 2006 to 2008, uh, uh, very sharp. Um, again, a bit of a drop back down, although fairly consistent, a real run of, of prices here. Uh, but that was back when the median price for a unit in green sites was a little over 150,000. Um, and now we're, we're 370,000. So, uh, so yeah, there's certainly been a, a drop back uh, in terms of unit values um, over the last 12 months. Do you think the unit will have further well, it's going to be an interesting one. So we're going to see, this will be the interesting thing, our median price is going to jump exponentially in green slopes uh, because what we have getting built right now is a bunch of units that are going to sell for five and six hundred thousand dollars. So we're going to see on this graph, it'll be, see, it'll be interesting how it's interpreted, our um, medium sale price is going to rise again over the next two years. Um, so that might be interpreted as a, a great return in form of the Greenside property market or the Cooper property market. Again, it's just going to be a shift in terms of where the values sort of sit. What does townhouses go with? Does that go with units? Yeah, it does, yeah. Yeah, so strata stuff. So yeah, that throws in all the all the townhouses and, and units together. Um, um, maybe will there be too many? Um, the, the crystal ball question. <laughs> 
I, I don't think so, is, is my, my thought on it. Um, there's obviously a lot of stuff being built around here. Um, yeah, I don't know whether Brisbane City Council's got it right or not, but the population projections and the people wanting to live in the closer to the city, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, yeah, I, I actually think the demand is there. Um, so it'll be interesting. I think there is a challenge for people who are now buying these new properties and where their values might sit over the next ten years because they're certainly paying a premium for new properties. Um, we don't know what a 10-year-old unit with a nice city view in green sites might be worth in 10 years' time because we haven't had stock like that now. We've got different stock. So, um, no, I don't think it will be. It'll be interesting to see what happens with, with rent. Because with rental Stone's years. Corner is established or...? Yeah, I, look, we're, we're a bit of an advocate for it, but you know, I think it's a great area. And what's happening here, I, I think it will attract a lot of people to want to live here. Um, there's a, there's a lot of units going in, but um, you know, there's a lot of units going in everywhere. You look at uh, some of these developments and what they're doing at Wool and Gabber and stuff, and you know, these things are selling. Um, so there will be people in them. Uh, what they rent for will be interesting, because uh, if you've bought one as investment, you're going to want a tenant in there. Uh, and maybe we'll have trouble summer. Some of them, yeah. Our, our vacancy period has increased. Uh, but having said that, um, yeah, for just a, some insight for us, um, out of 1,285 properties, um, we currently have 20 vacant. So the vacancy rates are still very, very low. Um, going back two years ago, though, that vacancy rate was probably less than less than 10. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so it's in some ways it's double, but. Yeah, so 20 properties out of 1,300 that are actually unoccupied at the moment. It's it's yeah, it's pretty low. So um, uh, we're looking at rents. Um, so this is rents over the last last quarter. Um, uh, this is how many properties being rented. But yeah, a, a little bit of a little bit of decline here in terms of, of rental values in terms of houses. Um, there's certainly a lack of demand. At the end of the day, we can see a pickup in houses in house sales. There's going to be some people coming out of that in terms of moving into, uh, into buying properties rather than, than renting, but yeah, it's certainly been a, uh, a drop back there. I uh, said so this data uh, is going back to quarter two of, of this year, so April to June. Uh, that continues, Mari? Mari's the expert there. Leveled off, still no, back a bit? Hasn't gone well. Yep. Yeah. You have to reduce some of your young uh, rental. Mm, we have had to, yeah. yeah. Units. The houses are going yeah. well. Yeah. yeah, so the interesting there, and again, we're, we're just getting into quarter two here, so we've got another quarter to look at. Um, but um, all bedrooms, in terms of units, fairly steady over the last 12 months. Um, but then we would think that there's been just a drop off in the last three months. So mm -hmm. yeah. when this data catches up, um, Isn't it actually good developments around them? Yeah, look, it's, it's supply and demand, essentially. So, um, from a tenant point of view, is yeah, they've got a bit of choice. So, um, <coughs> yeah, we, we've found them come back. Uh, in real terms, um, uh, and uh, you know, a rent might have dropped in real terms 10 or $15 dollars a week, um, yeah. maybe 20 uh, The other side of the coin is, um, what is your um, what's your mortgage costs done in that time too? So, um, for an investor, there's a fair chance that your your mortgage repayments have probably come down more than yeah. the change in the rent. So, it'd be lovely if we could keep it both ways, get a bit more in the pocket from the bank end. The rents are going up, but you know, it's obviously a fair indication of why but it's happening. But some of them have dropped because developments the side of too. Well, that can be a challenge, can't it? In terms of yeah, with what's going on right now and, and living in a construction zone and things like that. But yeah. um, but then that could, to me, that's a short-term problem too, isn't yeah. it? That's a right now problem and then we're going to have development done and infrastructure built and be associated stuff with that. So having a unit right in the mix of that sort of stuff might really... I mean, in the 90s, in Sydney, there was oversupply of units. I mean, I got yeah. stuck in Sydney for three units. Yeah. In the 90s, yeah. Yeah. I had to wait for seven... Yeah. 15 years to sell? To sell? Yeah. 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 It, was, you know. it was like that in Brisbane in the 90s. Everything used to take about three months to rent. So do you think that this was time getting... wouldn't it be <laughs> similar? Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think so. I don't think it's as bad as that. 
no. Yeah. That was yeah, that was interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Three months to rent. Yeah, everything. Right? Yeah. Keep out, keep out yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, look in perspective again from a rental point of view, um, we we were just looking at this yesterday. We've got uh, an average time frame to rent a property at the moment of about 26 days, which you know is really uh, ringing some alarm bells for us. Uh, that sounds like far too long. Now that doesn't mean your property's vacant for 26 days, um, yeah, because obviously you're trying to rent it generally when there's already a tenant there. So, but the actual process of finding a tenant take 26 days for us is an extremely long period of time. So, um, and we were used to. 14, 15 days, going back even just 12, 18 months. So, uh, so that's a bit of a shift. Um, 14, 15 days is great because there was no vacancy essentially. You'd have a rented before someone would move out and you could do a quick transition. So, um, so yeah, that's a little insight into what's happening in Greenside. If you'd like some info on what's happening somewhere else, more than happy to email it to you. Just let us know this stuff is, uh, yeah, there's some good reports in terms of looking at this stuff. So. Uh, I think that's all we've got uh, for tonight. A um, little quick plug for little quick plug for next month. Uh, next month we're doing a similar thing around uh, property investors uh, and some of the issues that people are having with property investment. And a lot of that talks about we'll be talking about uh, what you've got to do to minimise your vacancy period. Uh, when I say we're 26 days, uh, we are seeing property. There are properties at the moment that are sitting vacant for three months. Um, generally, funnily enough, some of the stuff we talked about tonight solve those problems too. Um, there is a marketing exercise to finding tenants as there is to finding buyers. Uh, a lot of the similar concepts uh, apply to finding tenants. So, um, yeah, look, um, thank you everyone. I hope that was good information tonight. Um, yeah, appreciate you all, all coming along. Um, yeah, love to see you here next month. So, uh, we're gonna have a coffee, gonna have some cake. Uh, yeah, please hang around, if you have any questions, we'd love to have a chat. Okay, thank you.